The title of the teaching this morning is Attesting Miracles. I'll explain that here in a minute. Uh, a friend and I were talking a few days ago. Actually, we we're having a Bible study together. And, uh, and he was wondering about the concept of Jesus. You know, uh, he said he's all God, right? But wasn't he also a man? And if he was a, a man with God powers then that's not fair because he wants us to be like him. But if we don't have those God powers, we can't do that. And, but if he was just a man just like us, then how in the world did he do all those great miracles? I mean, these are the kind of things that were going through this fellow's mind. And, and then listen to what he asked next. He said, so, so which was it? Was this a miracle-working God or a miracle working man? And so I want to try to answer that question for you this morning from Scripture. I want to show you some things about Jesus and miracles and, and how, uh, how he did miracles, why he did miracles, and what this might mean for us today in our daily walk with the Lord. So which is it? Was Jesus God or was Jesus man? Well, let's look at some scriptures on the subject real quick. Turn to Colossians 2, verse 9. The book of Colossians in the New Testament, chapter 2, verse 9. It says, For in him, Jesus, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Okay, well that makes it pretty clear. Jesus is God. He's all God, right? Now turn to Matthew 16. Matthew 16 and verse 13. Jesus is talking here and he refers to himself as son of man. He says, who do people say the son of man is? Oh, okay, well, then that means he's a man. Going down a little further, verses 16 and 17. Peter declares, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Okay, well, that makes it pretty clear. <laughs> He's God, right? I mean, if you're the Son of Man, you're man. If you're the Son of God, you're God. <sighs> what about Romans 5? Romans 5 and verse 15. It's talking about how our salvation came along. And it says, but the, Romans 5, 15. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one man, Adam, many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to many. Well, okay, now we're back to Jesus is a man. So which is it? Is Jesus God or man? Well, let me tell you what the church has taught for 2,000 years about this, and I believe that it's true, and that is that Jesus was all God, and he was all man, but he gave up temporarily the God part of himself, the God capabilities, the God resources, the things that were available only as a God, he laid those things down while he was a man here on this earth. You see, this is the point. Jesus, over and over, the Bible tells us that we need to be like Jesus. We need to do what he did. We need to have the same attitude. We need to have the same heart. And if he is our example... And yet he had some kind of special advantage, some kind of special superpowers over us. Well, it wouldn't be fair to ask us to be like him, would it? So turn to Philippians 2. I've showed you this before, but I want to reiterate it today. Because this explains how Jesus could be God, but also could be man. We're going to look at Philippians 2. We're going to start in verse 6. And this concept is called the kenosis. It comes from the Greek word kenosis, which means emptying. And in Philippians 2, verse 6, we read, Who, talking about Jesus, 
although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped or held on to or, um, or kept within himself. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, just like us, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on the cross. So Jesus emptied himself of those godlike attributes while he was here on this earth as a man. Have you ever heard anybody say, um, yeah, somebody's talking about, I'm going to fight with you, but I'm going to have one hand tied behind my back just to make it fair. Well, that's kind of what Jesus is doing here. It's like he's going to have his divinity <clears throat> tied away from him to make it fair. He's going to live here on this earth like a human being. So, okay. When Jesus lived here on this earth, although he was God, he lived completely as a man. No special powers. Then let's go back to one of the questions that my friend asked, okay? If Jesus was just a man like you and me, how in the world did he do all those miracles? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I want to see if I can give you an answer here. Um, the implication of all this is if Jesus, a man, could do all the great miracles that he did, then that must mean that we other human beings can do great miracles too, right? I mean, we're going to come back to that part in a minute. But how did the man Jesus do all these great miracles? Well, we sometimes call Jesus the Christ. Uh, the Jews called him the Messiah. Messiah doesn't mean Savior. It means the same thing as Christ means. It means the Anointed One. Uh, Christ isn't Jesus' last name. It's his description. It describes the most important thing about Jesus, and that was he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. The most important characteristic of Jesus was not that he was the Son of God. He laid down that divinity when he was born as baby Jesus. The most important characteristic Jesus had was that he was anointed by the Holy Spirit and he was anointed so that miracles could flow through him. Turn to Luke 4. Luke chapter 4. I'm going to look at verses 18 and 19 and 20. Luke 4.18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because, in other words, there's a reason the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to do some things. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And then He closed the book. And he gave it back to the attendant. He sat down. Now, he's in church, essentially. And they've asked him to read a passage. Well, this is the passage he chose. It was a prophecy out of Isaiah about him. And he sat down. All eyes were fixed on him. And then look at verse 21. He says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, he said, that's me that this prophecy is talking about. So how did Jesus get this anointing to do miracles? Wouldn't you like that anointing? I mean, where did it come from? Was he born that way? <laughs> well, <laughs> again, he was born just the way you and I are born, okay? <clears throat> Wouldn't be fair if he'd been born with special powers. So how could he expect us to be like him, work like him, do like him, uh, if he had some kind of special advantage? Well, let me show you how he received that anointing, okay? Turn to John 1. We're going to start by looking at how did John the Baptist know that Jesus was this anointed one, this Messiah that was to come. John 1, let's look at verses 33 and 34. 
Now, John the Baptist is talking him here, and he said, I didn't recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize him in water said to me, he upon, this is God in prophetic word talking to John the Baptist, he upon whom you see the Holy Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> John says, I myself have seen and I have testified that this is the Son of God. Well, when did the Holy Spirit come on Jesus and remain on him? Go back to Matthew 3. We're going to look at a description of the baptism of Jesus. Matthew 3. Let's start in verse 13. And Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. By the way, that was about a 50-mile trip uh, that Jesus did. And so Jesus goes to get baptized, but John tried to prevent him, saying, Look, I have need to be baptized of you. You're the Son of God, right? And, uh, and yet you've come to me. But Jesus said, Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John permitted him to be baptized. Now listen to this. After being baptized in water, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he, John the Baptist, saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting and remaining on Jesus. And behold, the voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Do you know what this verse describes? This verse is describing Jesus being baptized with the Holy Spirit. You heard me right. I believe that this is when Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit, just like we get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus had to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, right? This is where his anointing came from, his baptism in the Holy Spirit. This is where your anointing for miracles come from, is from you being filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, I have another question that's, why perform miracles anyway? Why did Jesus do that? Uh, what, what were miracles needed for anyhow? Well, I think there's two reasons. And the first one, turn to Matthew 14. Matthew 14, verse 14, says that uh, when he, Jesus, went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them and healed their sick. We see this over and over again in the Bible, how Jesus felt compassion for people. And that was what drove him to spend hours and hours and hours performing miracles and deliverances and things like that. But couldn't Jesus have just showed up and said, I'm the Son of God, follow me? I mean, wouldn't that have been enough? I mean, people have to take it by faith, right? Well, no. <laughs> we human beings just don't work that way, and Jesus knew it. Look at John 4. Some people read this verse that I'm about to read, John 4 and 48. When they read this, they read it as an indictment against human beings. But I think it, Jesus was just saying, this is the way you people are. Okay, John 4, 48. So Jesus said to them, unless you see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. Jesus is just stating a truth about human beings. We need to see miracles to believe and uh, an illusionist can do something that looks like a miracle, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but we need to see something that says, hey, this is miraculous. Now, there in John 4, 48, he says, unless people see miracles, they're not going to believe. Jesus is not just stating the truth about human beings that... Uh, uh, that is good news. In other words, the good news is when we see Jesus doing a miracle, we'll believe in him. But he's telling us something else that can be bad news as well. Because the bad news is illusionists, con artists, uh, demonic spirits, they can come along and show things that look like miracles as well. And we have to be careful about that. Now, 
Back to this question of why did Jesus do miracles, there's a phrase for that, and it's called attesting miracles. It means doing miracles as a sign or doing them to attest to your authority to do the miracles. The idea is that uh, if miracles are happening at your hand, since most people believe that only miracles can come from God, then that attests to or signifies or indicates or proves that God must be with you. The Jewish religious leaders of the time understood this. And that's what chapped them so bad because they didn't want to have to believe that Jesus was God. <laughs> they wanted to, uh, to discount this and say he's just a good teacher. <laughs> they didn't want to have to accept the attesting miracles, but they couldn't get away from those. Okay, Go to Luke 5. Let me show you. Jesus kind of put this in their face to make sure they had no excuse Luke 5, we're going to read verses 17 through 26. Um, it says, one day Jesus was teaching. Now he's in Capernaum, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and from Jerusalem. They had come 80 miles away when the, those that came from Jerusalem. That's a long walk. I mean, you've got to be serious about wanting to hear somebody and see what's going on to walk 80 miles to where they are. Well, this is the situation. And here Jesus is. The power of the Lord was uh, present, it says, to perform healing. And that means the anointing was on him for healing. And some men were carrying a, on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were trying to bring him in and set him down in front of Jesus. But they couldn't find a way in. There was just such a big crowd. And they went up to the roof. They tore up some of the tiles. And they, laid, they lowered this guy's stretcher on a rope. Put him right in the middle of the crowd. Right in front of Jesus. And in verse 20 it says, Seeing their faith, Jesus said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. I'm sure this guy. He's going, huh? I, I was kind of hoping I'd be healed. <laughs> and boy, for sure, the religious leaders got upset at this, saying, oh, man. They said, began to reason, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus, aware of their reasonings, answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins have been forgiven you? Or to say, get up and walk. But so that you may know. In other words, I'm going to give you a sign. I'm going to attest to you where my authority comes from. So you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your bed and go home. And immediately he got up from before them. He picked up what he had been lying on and he went home glorifying God. That's a testing miracle. Turn to Acts 2. The Bible's full of these kind of things. Acts 2, verse 22. In Peter's very first sermon on the day of Pentecost, he says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the, Ra the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and signs and wonders, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. Jesus was approved. He was accredited. He was attested by God by the signs and wonders that worked through him. John 14. John 14. We're going to look at verses 7 through 11. This is at the Last Supper. Jesus is talking to his disciples and they're asking him, you know, to show the Father to him and and he says, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you know him and you've seen him. And Philip goes, what do you mean? We haven't seen the father. We've seen you, but we haven't seen the father. Just show us the father. That'll be enough. And Jesus says, have I been with you this long and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has sent me has seen the father. Who, how can you say, show us the father? Do you not believe that I am of the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I don't speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Listen to this. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Otherwise, at least believe because of the works themselves. 
In other words, believe that I'm in the Father if for no other reason than the attesting miracles that happen at my hands. Signs are an indicator that something special, something supernatural is happening. That's the signs and the wonders and the works he's talking about here. If you get around somebody who's sick or in need of a miracle and the Holy Spirit anoints you to pray for them and, you know, have the guts to pray for them and have faith that the Father's going to hear your prayer and then He'll perform for them an attesting miracle. Give God a chance to prove Himself to others, okay? You know, through supernatural miracles that happen at your hands. So, remember I said that this thing that we human beings need to, um, need to see signs and wonders in order to believe is good news, bad news. Um, the good news, of course, is that helps us see where God is. But the bad news is that because of that human nature, um, you might see something that really isn't a miracle and be misled by it. You know, people say, you don't need miracles, uh, you just need to have faith. But that's not what the Bible says. Over and over, Old Testament and New Testament, God shows Himself through dramatic, tangible ways. He wants our faith to be based on His mighty works, not on the works of others. But there's a downside to that, because when someone else comes along that's not from God, they might be able to fool us with illusions, with magic tricks, with even demonic spirits and demonic signs and wonders. My grandson loves doing magic illusions, you know. And he and I sometimes will watch magicians on TV, like the Penn and Teller show. And I mean, some of the stuff they do is just incredible. It looks like a miracle. When my grandson does a card trick for you, you see what he does, and it looks like a miracle. I mean, it's just amazing. It's like, how in the world did he do that? That's just impossible. But he did it. You know it's an illusion, right? But sometimes there are people that do that in the name of the Lord. Debbie and I were invited one time to go hear a teacher, prophetic guy, and his claim to fame was that the Lord would put jewels in his mouth as he was teaching and sometimes would put uh, gold dust on his Bible. And that um, at their house in a special container, the Lord would produce bread and wine for communion. And uh, of course, it wouldn't, the Lord wouldn't do that in front of anybody. It had to be at their house in this special container. And uh, as he was teaching uh, uh, once or twice, he goes, Oh, oh, I feel the presence of God. He would reach into his mouth and he'd pull out a little uh, uh, jewel. It was obviously just a, a piece of uh, glass made to look like a jewel. And um, it was uh, Debbie and I realized, Oh, man, this guy is a fraud. He is a con artist. And these poor people are believing that. They're, they're seeing illusions and they're thinking that it's miracles. I mean, there are lots of tricksters that are willing to take advantage of Christians it, because we're hungry for signs and miracles from God. We want to see that. And these unscrupulous people that take advantage of us for money, for power, for fame, whatever it is. But there's something even worse than con artists and tricksters. Turn to Matthew 24. If you hear nothing else today, hear this. Matthew 24 Starting in verse 21, Jesus is talking about the end times. Matthew 24, 21, and he says, For then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. The elect, that's us. Then if anyone says to you, Behold, there is the Anointed One, or here He is, don't believe them. For false Christs, Anointed Ones, and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. I am firmly convinced that we are living in the last days, and we're in the end times that uh, Jesus was describing here, 
And we're living in the time when many evil people, many evil spirits are going to try to deceive us. And we're going to really need to be careful, be on our guard. Turn to 1 John 1, I mean 1 John 2. No, 1 John 4. 1 John 4, verse 1. 1 John 4, verse 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out in the world. We need signs and wonders to believe, but there are people that are going to take advantage of that. You need to test it. You know how we really knew that this guy with the jewels in his mouth was a charlatan? It was because when he began to teach, he began to talk about the special revelations that he had received from God. And it turned out that every special revelation he'd received was antithetical to, it was completely against what the Bible said. And he kind of explained this way, well, yeah, but the, the writer of the Bible didn't have the special anointing that I have and, you know, I, by the proof of the jewels. And so, um, so my anointing is just further understanding of these things that the writer of the Bible didn't have. Well, that's just garbage. I mean, when you hear somebody saying stuff like that, run, 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 <laughs> run away as fast as you can. <laughs> Turn to Revelation 13. Revelation chapter 13. We're going to look at verses 11 through 14. Revelation 13, starting in verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast. The first beast is, is what some call uh, the Antichrist. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it worship the first beast, this one whose fatal wound was healed. And he, listen to this, he performs great signs. He even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which have, has been given him to be performed in the presence of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who had a wound and of the sword and has now come back to life. <laughs> this prophet of the beast is going to have power to do signs and wonders. Now, are some of those illusions? I'll bet you that some of them will be. But I also suspect that some of them will be real demonic signs and wonders. Um, yes, I believe that demons can do miracles as well. I think it's a rare thing, but I've seen it. I think it's possible. Turn to Revelation 16. Revelation 16, 13, and 14. Are you going to be deceived? By these things, we're looking for signs and wonders to show us God, right? Are we going to be? Are we going to test the spirits? Or are we going to be deceived? Revelation 16, starting in verse 13. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to all the kings of the world to gather them together for war on the great day of God. These evil spirits are going to perform signs in the front of kings and world leaders to convince them that this beast who is leading the one world government is the one they ought to be following. And those signs, I'll bet you, are going to be convincing. They're going to look like the power of God, but they're not the power of God. Let's wrap up with several scriptures in a row real quick. Matthew 24, verse 24. Matthew 24, 24. Jesus says, For false Christs and false prophets will arise, will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Go down to verse 42. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day the Lord is coming. Go to... Matthew 25, verse 13. Matthew 25, 13. At the end of the parable of the uh, virgins and the lamps. Be on the alert then, Jesus says, for you do not know the day or the hour. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 6. Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, 
For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just as a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman with a child, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, you are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night or of darkness. So let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. Let us stay in this state of expectancy, expectancy of Jesus coming back, and be on the alert for false prophets and false signs and wonders. You know, part of this state of expectancy, in conclusion, uh, is going to involve signs and wonders. I think that we need to be seeking out every opportunity in these last days for God to work a miracle. I mean, pray for people and let the God do a testing miracles for them at your hands. Pray for people over the phone. Send the word of God. Send the word of healing to them and let God do a a testing miracle to them over the phone lines. Look for opportunities in your life to pray and pray first and expect a miracle first in your life. Well, next time I want to ask and answer these questions, okay? And that is, if I want attesting miracles to flow through me like they did through Jesus, then what do I have to do? How do I have to live? If I live like Jesus lived, can God work through me the same miracles that he worked through Jesus? And how would I live that way? So join me next time and we'll see if we can answer those questions.